Hi everyone, and welcome to the DevSecOps track. My name is Lars Fever, and I'm a volunteer at the OWASP community, and I'll be moderating this session. So during the next 45 minutes, we'll hear Noah Barkey present the Stable, stable Safer, Faster, aka how to avoid Kubernetes misconfig with automation. So please submit any questions you may have in the Q&A tab, and I'll be asking our speaker your questions in the last 10 minutes. So, and with that, I'll hand over the words, the, the world, the words to you, <laughs> Noah. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for joining me for this session. I'm super excited about it. And mainly because the story behind this talk actually began a long, long time ago. One day, my dear friend, Niv, who is also a colleague, he's a DevOps engineer in the company that I work for, has invited me to join him to a meetup. And I said, yeah, sure, sounds fun, what's, what's the meetup? And he said, I don't remember something about Flux, definitely GitOps. And well, first of all, he totally had me GitOps. I mean, come on. But there was still a small problem though, because I'm a developer. I'm not a DevOps engineer. I do, I do a lot of DevOps work and I do work with a lot of DevOps technology, but I'm a full stack engineer. So I told Niv, Niv, I don't think I should be there. Like I, I, I'm not like a real DevOps, you know? And he completely disagreed with me and told me that it's complete nonsense and that I should be there. He will send me the address. He told me be there to Noah. It's tomorrow 8 a.m. And I said, okay, let's do it. And we went. And ladies and gentlemen, it was the best meetup that I have ever been to. Why? Two reasons. First of all, it was the first time that I realized how much I love DevOps. And the second reason is that it was the first time that I said out loud that I believe that every developer should practice DevOps, at least a little bit. So now after I said it, now we can really start talking. So hi, everybody. My name is Noah Barki. I am a developer advocate and a full stack developer for about seven years. I'm also a tech writer, one of the leaders of GitHub Israel community, which is the largest GitHub community in the whole world, you know, in the whole universe. And I also work at an amazing company called The Tree, where we help developers and DevOps engineers to prevent Kubernetes misconfigurations from ever reaching production. But why am I telling you all this? It's because partly my job at the tree is not only to understand how Kubernetes work, but it also to understand how you can blow up your own cluster. So researching about misconfiguration is a big part of my role. But let's go back to the meetup story. So, oh, of course, I forgot that I have this slide. Yes, what are we going to talk about today? Today we'll talk about how to shift left, create an automated and fast pipeline for your Kubernetes deployments while preventing misconfigurations from reaching production. We'll talk about RBCD a little bit, we'll cover some pipelines, and we'll talk about best practices when it comes to Kubernetes. So now let's go back to the meetup story. So we went to the meetup, and obviously I was the only developer there. I remember that everybody seemed to be like so grown up, like they figured everything in life. And they started with a 40 minute session about Flux, which was very interesting. I way more a fan of Army City, but more on that later. And after that, the organizer said, pizza's in the bag, guys, let's take a short break and then we'll have a panel. So I looked at Dave and I was like so surprised. And Neve told me that apparently they have they having a panel, a cloud native experts panel where people can ask them whatever they want. And you know how it usually goes. People are too embarrassed to ask anything, right? So after four, four, three minutes of silence, one guy raised his hand and said that they started to use JFrog registry in the company that he works for. And that, and he shared that he's very frustrated with the developers and some of the DevOps engineer in, in his organization because not only that they don't know how to use the registry, they get so mad all the time because they upset that their builds are getting failed and he doesn't know what to do. So he asked the cloud native experts, 
what are the best practices when it comes to shift left? How I'm supposed to do it? And they talked about it. And then another guy raised his hand and said that, yeah, I actually have the same problem with the security issues. What am I supposed to do with those developers? And they talked about it. And then another guy raised his hand and said that he's too afraid to add Kubernetes resources to the application repository because he is afraid that the developers, those developers, will ruin everything. And they talked about those developers and those developers. And I was like sitting there hearing those developers who will ruin, who don't care, who don't understand, who don't know nothing about Kubernetes. And I was like, how can they say that? But but you know, I was too embarrassed to say something because I'm one of those developers, right? But after a few minutes, I calmed myself and I decided that no, 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 this is not a bug. This is a feature that I am the only developer here. So I raised my hand and I said, hi, <laughs> hi, hi, my name is Noah. I am a developer advocate and I'm a full stack developer. And may I speak in the name of my people? No, I didn't say that. I just asked permission to speak and permission was granted. I remember that everybody like turned around to see whose voice just got permission to speak in this panel. Obviously I was in the back. And Niamh like looked at me and was like, I don't know her. And I hesitated for a minute and I looked at everybody and I said, well, you say that we don't care. You say that we might ruin everything and that we don't know how to use Kubernetes or other mainly tech DevOps technologies. And you're right, you're right. But first of all, give me some credit here. I mean, you have to remember that we're different personas. We use different tools. We even have different goals. I mean, I wake up every morning to be the best feature machine that this world has ever seen. I have code to write, tests to run, bugs to fix. I have the next feature to plan. I also have tons of pull requests to review. And I also need to make sure that me and my teammates follow best practices regarding stability, maintenance, security, availability. I also need to make sure that my application, my features are reliable. So why should I suddenly care about those YAML files that you put to my repository? What the heck is Terraform and why is the memory limit so important? How do you expect us to work together on the same technology when I don't even understand it? And then one guy has asked me the question that I fear the most. He said, so what do you suggest? And I looked at him, I was so embarrassed. But once again, I decided that no, 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 this is not a bug, this is a feature, this is not a bug, this is a feature. And I said that, well, if you think about it, Kubernetes sort of like grabbed everybody and made us sit at the table for the first time, maybe, like all of us, and made us, made us work on the same technology. We have the IT, we have the devs, we have the QA, we have, machine learning engineers, data scientists, security experts. And surprisingly, the only one that actually know how to use Kubernetes, the cluster admin, the Kubernetes champion is the DevOps. So here it, go, here it goes, with the blink of an eye, the DevOps become a bottleneck. And this is why I see a lot of people talk about shift left, shift left security, shift left tests. And I even saw some articles and sessions about how to shift left data management, which was awesome if you ask me about. The one thing that people tend to forget is how to shift left responsibilities. And I hate that because if for instance, I shift left security, DevSecOps, and I decide that this is, this is something that I'm going to do. Now it is my job right now as a DevOps engineer to scan my images, to make sure that I don't pull vulnerabilities images, that it's my job is to make sure that everybody uses the just shells instead of tags and other responsibilities. This is my responsibility now, but nobody teaches me how should I supposed to, what, how, how I'm supposed to do it? Where should I start? Everybody talks about how important it is, but not about the responsibility. 
So let's talk about how to delegate responsibilities, how to shift left, not only the security or the testing or whatever you want to shift left, but it's also how you shift left the responsibility, how you make it like, really effective in your organization. So starting with delegating the knowledge, you need to learn about best practices and to teach others in the organizations. Educate the developers, for instance, about Kubernetes. What is Kubernetes? What are its main components? Why specific configurations like memory limit are so important for their own work? Educate them in terms they will understand and explain to them what's in it for them, how this is important for their own work. For instance, don't just ask the developers to um, use digest shaz instead of tags. No, explain to them that shaz are basically hash identifiers for the images and that tags are mutable. So if you use hash or shaz that are basically work the same as git commits, you can guarantee that your image is the same. So you prevent images in production from changing unexpectedly because attackers can override the tag. And I promise you that if you will explain it to them in a way that they will understand why it is so important for their own work, they will not do the same mistake again because nobody wants to take down production. And this is everyone's responsibility. But you're probably thinking to yourself, oh my God, no, are you crazy? I'm not going to start Udemy courses right now. I have a lot of things to do. I have a job, you know? So yeah, it doesn't mean that suddenly you need to educate everybody about Kubernetes and everybody needs to learn everything about Kubernetes. No, do it wisely. Choose your champions. Pick those developers who are most interested in infrastructure code. It's usually the backend developers because it's sort of like the backend of the backend but it's not really necessary. But choose those developers and educate your knowledge to them. Why? Well, think about it. Every organization has those front-end and back-end developers. Uh, you have those front-end developers who will never do back-end development. But on the other hand, you have those back-end developers who will never do front-end developers de development because it's only styling and CSS and blah, pixels. I don't like it. But Every once in a while, you have those true full stack developers. You have those developers who do both, who belongs to both tribes, who can explain the backend developers what is the front end development and vice versa. This is the kind of developers that you look for, but with DevOps technology, with security responsibilities, because they belong to both tribes and they can become your ambassador in every dev team. And once you do it, and it, trust me, it will take time, it's a process. And they don't need to understand everything about AWS or Google or GK or whatever. They need to understand the most relevant stuff that are related to the world. But when they understand it, when they gain your trust, grant them permissions, permit them to educate the rest of the developers, because then you will see that when a developer needs to ask something about the CICD or whatever, they will come to the champion instead of you. And here you reduce the bottleneck from yourself and you can be more focused on the rest of the things that you need to do. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, sounds interesting, but how, Let's, let's talk in practice, how do I do it? So there are many ways to learn and share knowledge. When it comes to sharing knowledge, you can have company internal meetups, you can share newsletters and white papers, and you can share emails. And when it comes to learning about best practices, the most efficient way, if you ask me, is to learn from other companies' failure stories, trust me. Before we launched the tree, we wanted to learn as much as possible about the common misconfigurations and the pitfalls in the Kubernetes area. So what we did was to read more than 100 Kubernetes failure stories. And this is why I would like to welcome you to my very own private show, What's the Mistake Game Show? Woo! Are you ready? Okay, let me explain it again. So the game goes like this. I'm going to show you two Kubernetes manifests. Each time I'm going to point into a specific key on every manifest. 
you will have to look very carefully and tell me, well, you can't tell me, but you can tell me later in the Q&A how, how did it went for you. And you will have to decide which one you will deploy, left or right, green or blue. Are you ready? Let's do it. So this is a current job configuration. Pay attention to the concurrency policy. Which one you will deploy, left or right? I'll give you I'll give you like ten seconds for that. I should have had like the sound of like tick 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 to make it more interesting. Okay, shut up. And the right answer is right. We always want to make sure that we set the concurrency policy to either forbid or to replace, because if we won't, whenever the cron job will get failed, it won't replace the previous one. And this is actually something that happened to Target. They had one failing cron job that created thousands of pods that were constantly restarting. And not only that it took their cluster down, but it also caused them a lot of money. Let's move forward quickly to the next question. This is another cron job configuration. And once again, pay attention to the concurrency policy. Which one would it be? Left? All right. Are you ready? And the right answer is right again. You see here on the left side, the concurrency policy isn't part of the cron job spec. So we end up with cron job basically without any limits. And this is actually what happened to Zalando, which is an online fashion company with over 6,000 employees. They actually used the correct configuration or they placed it incorrectly in their YAML, which basically took their API server down. And yeah, very, very, very sad story. Let's move forward to the next and the last question. I hope you're with me. It's supposed to be very easy for you. Containers, this is a simple pod. Which one would it be, left or right? And of course, the right answer is the right. And I'm sure you all got it, but unfortunately, Blue Metador, which was a small startup company back then, they forgot to add the memory limit. And what happened to them is that they, their pod basically hosted a Simulogic application and their container are memory hogs. So without having any limits, nothing basically stopped from those containers to take up all the memory in the cluster and eventually closed out of memory issues. Sorry, uh, very sad, very sad story. But you see, Blue Metador and Zalando and Target, they aren't the only companies who suffered from these pretty innocent mistakes. I'm talking about big companies. I'm talking about Google, Skyscanner, Spotify, Airbnb, Datadog, Toyota is not there, and Docker and Microsoft. And talk about, talk about it with me after this session. I have tons of story to share with you how Tesla accidentally forgot one of their credentials and an attacker did the micro um, crypto mining uh, on their services. It's, the stories are endless. And first of all, this is why I highly recommend you to read about other companies' family stories. Not only that you will learn so much about best practices, what to do, what not to do, and you will think about other edge cases, which you probably wouldn't have think about. It will also, very important, because it will force you to ask yourself the ultimate question, which is how can I make sure it will never happen to me? How can I make sure I won't become one of those failure stories? What is the stability and the security that I want to achieve for my production? And how do I do it? So for my research, there are three types of misconfigurations when it, basically when it comes to communities, but it's relevant to all infrastructure code, actually. 
So the first type of misconfigurations is what I like to call syntax error, which combines all the mistakes that happen because we accidentally submitted invalid YAML file or Kubernetes resource with invalid schema. And I know it may sound very basic, but you would be surprised to know how many companies share their stories, their failure stories, because they accidentally submitted invalid YAML file or invalid Kubernetes resource. My favorite story actually is the Skyscanner one. They accidentally deleted their curly braces, one of their curly braces in their home chart, and it basically deleted all their namespaces with, and left them with one corrupted namespace, and they had five hours of production down, downtime. Yeah, five hours. So yeah, we have the syntax errors, but the next type of misconfiguration is what I like to call knowledge issues, which combines all the mistakes that happen because as I said, when we talk about Kubernetes, we have a lot of different personas working on the same technology. And usually, often, most of the personas don't know what are the best practices, how to actually use Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is like, it's like a pilot cockpit. You have so many buttons and so many op options to configure it, that usually the default configuration is not the one that most suitable for you. So um, it's, I see a lot of misconfigurations that happen because we used, I, companies used the default configurations and uh, they mis misconfigured their uh, Kubernetes resources. But knowing about the industry best practices is not enough. You also need to make sure that you are aligned with your teammates, that you and your teammates are aligned with the same best practices and that you are aligned with the internal best practices in your organizations for things like using the private registry for your resource for your images or to setting a specific amount of limit for your production cluster, cluster resources and another type for your um, de development clusters. And I don't know, it's pretty much dependent on your organization, but you need to make sure that you are aligned with your teammates. So let's review each one of these types of misconfigurations and see how we can prevent it from happening to us. So starting with the syntax errors. First of all, we want to make sure that our file format is correct, whether it is JSON, YAML, Docker files, XML, whatever, JUnit, whatever the file format that you use, you need to make sure that it's correct, right? So I highly recommend you to use the open source YQ project. It's a portable CLI YAML processor and it's so easy to use. I highly recommend you to use it for verifying that your file format are correct. But after that, we also want to make sure that whatever is written in that file is also correct, right? So we basically want to verify our resource syntax that schema, that the resource syntax is according to, is correct according to the schema. And the built-in option that we can do is to use the kubectl with the dry run flag, which basically tells kubectl to Kubernetes and the API server to not apply this resource to only validate it. Now, there are a couple of issues with this approach. And usually I prefer the native option, but still. First of all, everybody needs to make sure, everybody needs to have kubectl access, which is usually not the case. But let's say that everybody has kubectl access. To use the dry run flag, you need to use one of the following strategies. You can use the client strategy, which is not very helpful because it only prints out the resource that you want to submit. And the service strategy, which is actually the one that we look for, is required cluster connection. And you certainly don't want to give everybody in the organization cluster connection right now. So as an alternative, I highly recommend you to use the cube confirm. We even use it in the tree. It basically allows you to do the same thing and to verify your resource syntax but without any cluster connection, without any kubectl uh, permissions, because it pulls all Kubernetes resource schemas into a GitHub repository, and then it sends the request to that repository. So very recommended. Uh, I use it all the time. 
let's talk about best practices. How do we make sure that we follow these best practices and how do we actually enforce this on development because we want to shift left, right? So first of all, you need to define the policies and the rules that you want to enforce. Whether it is about network policy, whether it is about memory limit, or to make sure that every container has a liveness or readiness probe, or I don't know, the requirement, the policies that you will decide are dependent on the requirements of your workloads. The real question is, how will you distribute those policies? How and where you will enforce those best practices? Because where you will enforce those best practices might affect your entire organization. And if you shift left and you enforce the policies in the CI, which is highly recommended if you ask me, but you need to remember that it will affect everybody in the development teams in your organization. So you really need to think about it and think about where will be the most suitable place for each type of policy that you want to enforce. Now let's dig a little deeper when it comes to policy enforcement. And the first thing that I want to that I want to talk about before we see some some things and some stuff in action is to start slow, do it gradually. Remember the guy from the meetup story that told that told everybody that they started to use JFOG registry and that he's very frustrated. His problem was that. On one day, they decided to drop on everybody a gigantic restriction regarding the images and packages. No, don't do it. Do it gradually. Choose one team. Have that team as your pilot team. Have a meeting. Make sure everybody understands what is the scope of this enforcement. Why is it so useful? Why now? Why today? When is the most suitable time? Have agreement with everybody and then gradually add the enforcement to the pipeline. Just do it slowly. Don't drop on everybody gigantic restrictions and policy enforcement in one day. Now, I believe in two things, especially when it comes to enforcement, but I believe in two things. I believe in shift left and I believe in GitOps. I believe that every Kubernetes resource should be handled exactly the same is your source code. And I believe that your Git repository should be your single source of truth. And as soon as you identify a mistake, the less it might take your production down. This is a fact. So with this mindset, the way I see it, we should automatically validate our resources on every code change in the CI. And furthermore, integrating and validating your resources in the CI with tools that can be used as a local testing library can extremely help you nurture the DevOps culture in your organization. Because developers, they are used to it. They are used to local testing. This is actually part of their policy. Every developer runs the unit test package locally on here, on his or her machine before they submit a pull request. And guess what? They expect at least those tests to be run again in the CI. So allowing the developers to do the same with infrastructure code and Kubernetes resources will allow you to delegate more responsibilities to the developers. And therefore it will liberate you from the constant need to guard and fence every Kubernetes resource from any possible misconfiguration. And you can adjust this to any type of team you want to delegate your responsibilities to. Because if you want to delegate responsibilities to the DevOps, just need to think about what are the tools that the DevOps use and to try adjust the tools that you give to them for policy enforcement to make sure that they resemble as much as possible to the tools that they are used to work with. Let them play in their own field. Okay. So let's talk real business. So I said that I am a GitOps believer and I'm also an RBCD fan. Now, I don't know how many of you use RBCD, but that's all, let's talk about it. Let's talk about RBCD for a minute. Now to really understand the essence and the advantages in RBCD, let's talk about how a CD workflow looks like without RBCD. So 
you know how it usually goes. We have the developer that push new code to the application and triggers the CI pipeline. Now, let's say that I use Jenkins and, of course, Kubernetes cluster in production. Now, in the CI server, we test the code, we build the code, we build new image of the application, and we store that image in the Docker registry. Then the CD server, for example, Jenkins, update Kubernetes deployment resource of the application and deploys it to the cluster. Now, there are a couple of challenges with this pipeline. First of all, for Jenkins to actually do everything that I said, we need to allow him allow it to work with kubectl. So for kubectl to actually work, we need to configure some, we need to configure it access for our Kubernetes cluster in Jenkins. Additionally, since we work with cloud provider, for instance, EKS, we need to provide Jenkins some AWS credentials, which is a security issue and a configuration issue, issue if you ask me. Now, another issue, which is much more important, in my opinion, is that once Jenkins update the deployment, we don't have any visibility over that deployment status. If something goes wrong, if the deployment is unsuccessful, we need to manually look into the logs, which is very inconvenient, and we often can miss a lot of stuff. So Argo City is meant just for that, and it was built to make continuous deployment for Kubernetes clusters much more efficient. And it does it by simply reversing the flow. Instead of pushing the deployment to the cluster, Argo pulls the deployment from the repository and applies it to the cluster. And this is the big part. Argo CD is part of the Kubernetes cluster, so you don't need to provide any secrets or credentials for it to actually work. So let's review how a CD, how, how a CD workflow looks like with Argo CD. So it goes the same, developer commits something, triggers the CI, the CI server, we build, we push. And then when we update the deployment YAML, Kubernetes deployment YAML, Argo detects the changes and pulls those changes from the repository, not, not from Jenkins, from the repository and applies it to the cluster. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, what will happen if I will type kubectl apply and I will update some changes manually? Since Argo CD is installed on the cluster, when you do so, something like that, Argo, Argo CD controller will detect that the cluster is now out of, is out of sync with the state that in the repository. And it will overwrite the state in the repository with the cluster state which will make our Git repository our single source of truth. Now, I talked a lot about repositories. And this is important. So a quick note about repositories when it comes to GitOps. Not necessarily Argo CD, but it's important. So it's been established as a best practice when it comes to GitHub to separate the repositories and to have one repository for all the source code of your application and another repository for all the configurations. Why? Because you have a lot of configuration files. We have ingress, we have services, we have deployments, we have ham chart, maybe Terraform, we have maybe customized. We have a lot of configurations files that we need to manage. And when we change service, for instance, we don't want to trigger all the CI CD pipeline for our application. So it's a best practice to separate between the application re uh, repository source code and application configuration repository. So if you look at how CD workflow with our CD looks now, when we separated our repository, we have the developer, which triggers a, a commit and triggers the CI server, does the code, build the image, push to the registry, update Kubernetes resources with the new image and push and update it, not push and update it in a different repository, in the GitOps repository where all the application configuration managed. RCD watch that repository and applies those changes 
to the cluster. So if you think about it, in the CI of that repository, you can start your policy enforcement and not in the application repository. Now, the good news is that you have champions, dev, dev champions that you can trust. And let's say that you work with GitOps and you work with RBCD and you define the tools and you define all the policies and the rules that you want to enforce. And there are many open source tools that you can use to, in, to use for policy enforcement. You can use OPA, you can use Kaverno, you can use Gatekeeper, Conf, Gator. You can you have a lot of open source tools that you can use and they're all open source, so you can use them today. The bad news is that this is only the beginning because you also need to manage all your policies. And by that, I mean to have an easy way to dynamically adjust your policies. And I see a lot of people that tend to think that Git is the place to do it. And Git is great for implementation and for version control, but not for management, because Git won't provide you anything that you need. Git won't provide you, for instance, a visibility over which policies are being practiced. And Git won't provide you a way to grant permissions over who can create or delete a policy. And when you have dozens of Git repositories and you have dozens of policies, now you have another nightmare to make sure that everybody actually uses the same version of your policy. So not only you want to make sure that everybody is using the same version of Kubernetes resources, you need to worry about having the same version of your policies. This is absurd. So you need to make sure you have one place where you can control, review, and monitor your policies. And the next important thing that I wanted to talk about is that it's crucial to provide guidelines along with your policies on how to actually fix the policies. Think about me, I'm a developer, right? and you certainly don't want to make me feel frustrated, definitely after putting all that effort in creating and in defining the policies that you want to enforce, you don't want to make me feel frustrated because I don't know how to fix one of the policies when it gets failed. Maybe I don't know how to add the liveness problem. You want to make me feel frustrated? No, of course not. And I do know, but you know, those developers, no. <laughs> anyway, it's really important to provide guidelines, detailed guidelines on how to fix the policies. Tell them why it's so important, where it got wrong, and how to do it. And I promise you, if you do it, no developer will do the same mistake again. And this is why having the centralized policy management is crucial. Now, as I said, you have many open source tools that you can use to start your policy enforcement in your organization. But the tool that I want to talk about today, because they all take different approach, the tool that I want to talk about today is the tree. And to show you how we believe in the tree is the right way to start your policy enforcement. So what is the tree? The tree is an open source centralized policy management solution for Kubernetes. So, and, and it was built to help DevOps engineers to delegate Kubernetes responsibilities to the developers teams more efficiently. So if you think about it, imagine the pipeline. On the one side, on the one hand, you have the DevOps engineers, who are the cluster admins, who are the best, who knows the best practices and what are the necessary enforcement in Kubernetes. But on the other hand, you have the developers who actually needs to follow these best practices on development. So the tree is right there in the middle between everybody. We have an open source CLI that allowed the DevOps teams to implement and control their policies in a centralized location and on the other hand, we provide a way to, for the developers to scan and validate their resources locally and in the CI on development. So when a DevOps engineer they change one of the policies, modify one of the policies, the tree propagate those changes across all the pipeline. So as I said, we have an open source CLI, we have thousands of stars, dozens of contributors. I'd highly encourage you to join our community. It's very much alive and to submit a pull request. 
And the way that it works is that it basically combines everything that we just talked about. For every file and for every resource that you run the CLI with, the tree test and the path that you want to scan, for every file and resource that exists on that path, the tree runs three steps, automated three steps checks. It validates that your file is actually valid and that your Kubernetes resource schema is correct. And the last but not least, it verifies that the policy checks that your file is actually according, following to the best uh, practices in the industry. Now, we know how much effort it takes to define policies and rules. So we don't think you should waste your on your all your time on that. We've got your back. We already come with built-in policies and best practices for Kubernetes, RUCD, and other CNCF projects. And yes, as I said, it is specifically designed to be ran in the CI or as a local testing library or even, even as a pre-commit tool. Now, oh my God, what happened to my slide? Okay, um, sorry about that. Um, it's supposed to be here. So um, to get started with the tree, first of all, you need to install it on your machine. It's a basic kernel command. And then you can use the CLI to scan your resources. Now, if you want to scan your resources on development or in your local machine or in the CI, as, as I showed you, you can use the tree test, the CLI with the tree test command, and the test of all the files that you want to scan. But if you want to scan your resources in production in the cluster, you can use our kubectl plugin in with tree test and to give it all the parameters and the namespace and the resources that you want to scan. And very soon we'll have our own webhook, a admission webhook. So stay tuned. And yeah, this is uh, how you can integrate the tree in the CI. And addition. In addition to the CLI, we also provide you a way to dynamically adjust your policies and way to manage all your policies. So we have a dashboard application where you can configure your policies using, co using code, using policies code. You can define it once and then run it everywhere. And you can monitor and review all your policies to see all your policies execution to get full observability over your status. You can grant permissions, you can get reports and a lot of management stuff. Now, to sum up, I, I highly, um, I really hope that this session inspired you to start thinking about the policies in your organization. And I really hope that now you will start to see your job, your DevOps, that the DevOps is really not a role and that, um, yeah, basically, basically it. And thank you very much for watching this video. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, Noah, for the uh, interesting session. What an energy you have, I must say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very cool to listen to. I don't see any um, questions in the Q&A, um, but, but I've got some for you. Um, OK. Let's say um, an organization wants to adopt the, the ROCD or, or whatever GitOps tool or, or policy management. Uh, what are some of the common pitfalls that can happen when, when adopting that so actually um I, I i planned the demo but i saw that i might not have enough time so um maybe i can do it right now but um there are uh, some pitfalls that okay let, let me ask you a question before i answer yours um are you talking about like miscon practical misconfigurations that you can do on your resources when it comes to argo or in more high level in more high level. Uh, in more high, high level. Um, so I think that I, I don't have many types of pitfalls when it comes to Argo City because it's pretty straightforward. It, it is a young project, but the community is thrive and it is amazing. So I don't see a lot of pitfalls or issues that an organization can have like at a higher level. Um, um, but when it comes to how to configure it, yeah, there are many, 
there are many ways to like um, screw up your um, to screw up your uh, or RBCD and configurations. Uh, there are many ways because RBCD is so versatile, and you can plug it in basically like plug and play, and you need to configure everything. So, for instance, if you have mono repo, and one of the best practices that nobody uh, talks about is to make sure you don't use the default configuration of RBCD, which is to watch uh, the repository every three seconds. Because when you have one repo and your repository is huge, then it can be performance issues. It can, uh, RBCD can be very, very slow and it can um, overload your repository. And the best practice is to use the webhook. So there are, there are challenges when you start to work with RBCD on how to actually configure it, but um, it's pretty much plug and play. And, and RBCD is only one project when it comes to Argo. So you also have the workflows and you also have events and you have the rollouts. And workflows is basically to run jobs on Kubernetes cluster and rollouts is for rollouts. And it gives a full, a nice detailed um, for a canary or blue green, uh, blue green rollout, which is very, very nice because it's, it uses CRDs for that and it's super cool. I, I can actually show you if you want. Yeah, I think we have some, some time to spare um, to go for yeah, it. Yeah, okay, so let's, okay let's do the demo that I was too afraid to do. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's pretty short, actually. I was just too, too afraid. Uh, okay, so here's, let me just switch to see my tabs. Okay, this is good. Okay, so as you can see here, I have a, a demo application. This is my Mobix um, we, uh, Marcelado ice cream shop. You see my screen? We still see the uh, to sum up slide. Okay, I'll share, I'll share it again. Okay, not this one, this one. Okay. So uh, this is a this is my application, my Barcelato ice cream shop application, and um, I used the Argo CD for the CD pipeline. So this is basically how Argo CD UI looks like, and I really like it because you can see all the relationship in your application resources, and it's very very nice. And to configure it, it's super simple. Basically, you need to tell Argo CD, this is the repository that I want you to uh, watch. And this is the cluster that I want you to be installed on. So to install Argo CD, the typical deployment is very straightforward. You just create Argo CD namespace, which is one of the best practices actually, because if you don't, then the internal components, you need to reconfigure them, which can be very messy sometimes. And then you simply apply all the uh, CRDs, the cluster rules bindings, and the repository server and the controller and everything that Argo CD needs, you install it on your cluster, pretty straightforward. And after that, you need to tell Argo CD, this is my application, this is my repository. I need you to watch on that and to apply it to the cluster you installed on. So when you... Uh, uh, when you go to Argo CD, you just simply go here, new application. Right, let's do test demo. And the project is default. Project is like um, the parent of application. You can have multiple application in one project. Right now, I don't want the application to be coupled. So I use the default project. And sync policy is whether I want Argo CD to um, automatically check for changes or a new commit hash on every three seconds or not? Do I want to do it manually? So let's choose automatic. And there are a lot of uh, other uh, configurations. This is my repository URL. I want you to revision the head. And now I need to give it the path of all the files that I want it to watch on. Argo only watches on Kubernetes files, but it's important to give it the path of all the files where, where they are located in the repository. Now, this is a cluster that you are installed. And 
apply everything to the Mobix Barkilado Barkilado up namespace and pretty much that it. Now, now I will have two applications with the name. So I think that what is the problem? Um, And now this is pretty much the same application, but as you can see, Argo just pulls everything. Uh, I don't know why I have this part of the, oh yeah, okay. So Argo basically like run everything and syncing all the, uh, all the uh, resources from the repository. It's not really healthy, I think, to have two applications in the same repository, but uh, it's for the demo's sake. And as you can see here, I can let's review the code. I can this is the and this is the code of the repository um, with the application, and I can change my deployment to use different uh, image. Let's say that I wanted to use V two. Two, right? V one one, one one zero, and now when I will deploy it, it commit. Yes, um, let's say change deployment image. Hit push. And let's move to this. Let's help Argo a little bit. And now we can see that is out of sync and it's supposed to, what are the warnings? Application and this is part of application. Yeah, okay. It doesn't like the second application, it's deleted. No, this is not good. Okay, uh, it was a bad idea, I think. But let's. Oh, okay, not, not it works. So now the sync is okay, and as you can see, Argo deploys my new uh, image. It will take some time. I have. The network is offline. Yeah, I need to maybe. Yeah, I have some network issues because I host it locally, but as you can see, it's already started with deploying the uh, next image. And if we wait, I can show you the, the different kind of the application. And what I did in my repository is that I added tree as a workflow just in, in the CI. So if I open a pull request, in, if I open a pull request, I can see that I run the tree. I have a pull request actually prepared that I run the tree in the CI so I can enforce it and validate my resources on every code change. So Argo cities take care of all the CD part and in the CI I can use GitHub action for whatever I want. And in the CI file repository, I can integrate the tree and any you know, policy enforcement tool that you want to use. All right, cool. Thanks for the uh, for the demo, Noah. Uh, I've, I see we we got an, uh, a question in the Q and A. Um, yeah. So for okay for you, I'll I'll ask it. Uh, with the proposed separation between configuration and source codes, where is the mm -hmm. best place to put infrastructure as code? Uh, that depends. I see a lot of uh, people that. Think that it's it's uh, it's supposed to be in a different repository, and I I think it makes a lot of sense because it, it's like a different uh, responsibility and a different uh, like a different logic unit, and you usually need to configure it on a different uh, scale. I think it's the right word, but um, it's pretty much depend on how you work. So if you want to elaborate maybe a little bit how your organization work 
maybe what are the, uh, how many people you have in your team, how many teams you have. If your teams work on, you have like a couple of teams that work on the Terraform and on the infrastructure, then yeah, having a separated repository much, I think it would be best. But if not, if, if it's just like um, simple, uh, if it's, it's not a lot, then you can use a one repository for all the configurations. Yeah, okay, thanks for the answer. I think that uh, that's pretty clear. Um, you spoke a lot about uh, Argo CT. Um, mm -hmm. I know there are other GitHub, GitHub tools like Flux. Um, yeah. How, how would you compare them? Argo CD and Flux are potato, potato. And they are the same pretty much. I think one of them has tenant support, which is Flux, I think, not Argo CD. But other than that, they are the same thing. Um, and I prefer Argo CD because it also provides me the rollout and the events and the workflows. If you work with machine learning, then it's it's really useful. And I really like the view of Argo City. Flux doesn't have this kind of view. I'm uh, like they got me hooked when I saw it. Uh, it is amazing. So um, Flux, in my opinion, is great, and it's 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 the same. Like you don't even need to change a lot of your configuration if you think about it, but um, it's pretty much the same thing. Anyway. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, I see no other questions. Um, so I think we're good to, to wrap up this session. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for watching. Yeah, I want to thank you, uh, Noah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.